Okay, so uh, years ago, I wrote a Sunday school study, a series of lessons on how to interpret the Bible. And one of the weeks of that series was about interpreting narratives. Uh, the Bible has several genres of writing literature, uh, and narratives, or stories, is one of those. There's also poetry, there are letters, there's prophecy, there's various genres, and narratives is one of them. And each type of literature needs to be interpreted differently. You read poetry different than you read a textbook, hopefully. Uh, well, at the start of this lesson on interpreting narrative, I told people that I was going to give them a really bad interpretation from the Bible. And their challenge was to figure out why it was bad. They would intu intuitively know it was bad, but could they explain why it was bad? So here's the bad interpretation. Back in Genesis, Joseph is sold into slavery to Potiphar. Potiphar soon realizes that whatever Joseph does goes well, and so Potiphar puts Joseph in charge of everything he has, and things go really well for Potiphar. Later, Joseph is thrown into prison, and the warden notices that whatever Joseph does goes really well. And so the warden puts Joseph in charge of almost everything in the prison, and things go really well for the warden. So here's my interpretation. If you can get a good slave to do your work for you, you should do that because things will go really well for you. Now, as I said, this is a bad interpretation from the Bible. But do you know why it's bad? After all, everything I said except the conclusion is true. So if putting a slave in charge worked well for Potiphar, and it worked well for the warden, and the Bible says both those things happened, then why can't I conclude that putting a slave in charge of your stuff is a good thing to do? Well, here's the reason. That's not the point of the story. Things didn't go well for Potiphar and the warden because they had a slave. Things went well for them because they had Joseph. Things went well because of Joseph, and God was working through Joseph to accomplish his plan. See, in Genesis 15:13. God had told Abraham that one of his, or that all his descendants, his descendants would be enslaved in a foreign country for 400 years. So God brought Joseph to Egypt as a slave to accomplish this plan. And making Joseph successful, eventually raising Joseph up to be second in command of the entire country, was part of God's plan to get his people, Abraham's descendants, Joseph's brothers and his father, down to Egypt. And getting the family down to Egypt was part of God's plan to eventually rescue the people from Egypt in the Exodus. And the Exodus from slavery in Egypt was part of God's plan to eventually bring about our Exodus from slavery to sin. So when we read the story of Joseph with that big picture in mind, we see that the point is that God is in control and that he can even use someone's enslavement for his purposes. And at the end of the story, Joseph even says this to his brothers, who originally were the ones who sold him into slavery. He tells his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. So Joseph is saying this entire thing was part of God's plan. So in order to understand narrative in the Bible, you need to understand how that portion of the story fits in to the whole Bible. You need to ask, why is this here? And what part does it play in the big picture? The story of Joseph is not a story about slavery. It's not a story about how slaves can do good work. It's a story about how God has worked through history to accomplish his purposes. And this ultimately is how you read any narrative. <clears throat> when you read Harry Potter, there are lots of parts of Harry Potter that make you think Snape is a horrible person. But those parts fit into the big story and everything turns out very differently. You have to understand the whole story. You can't just take out a part of it and try to make a moral lesson from that without understanding the big picture. But not everyone understands this. We should, it's how we should interpret all narratives, but not everyone always gets the big picture when they read. Right now in our society, there's lots of debate about book banning going on. 
Uh, right now, there's very particular books. But did you know that Huckleberry Finn and To Kill a Mockingbird are on the list of the most banned books? And they're both banned because they use offensive racist language. But if you read Huckleberry Finn and To Kill a Mockingbird, they are very clearly written to challenge racism. But not everybody gets that. They read, they see a racist word, and they say, this is a bad book. It's racist. They don't get the big picture. When we read narrative, we need to understand the big picture. It's easy to read narrative and come to very wrong conclusions if you don't pay attention to the real point of the story. And so I want you to keep that in mind today as we read this next part of Daniel. Today we're going to be looking at most of Daniel chapter 9, specifically verses 1 through 23. Uh, but before I read this passage, uh, while some of you are turning in your Bibles or swiping in your Bibles uh, to Daniel chapter 9, I want to give a quick bit of context for anyone who isn't very familiar with the book of Daniel or maybe familiar with the Bible. Uh, first, the Bible was written over a series of about 1,500 years by dozens of different people. Now, we often think of the Bible as one book, but it's actually a collection of 66 shorter books. It was originally written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Uh, but the book we're going to be looking at, of those 66 books that we're going to be looking at today, that we've been going through this year in University Church, is the book of Daniel. And it's called the book of Daniel because it was written by the prophet Daniel. He lived in the 6th century B.C., during a time called the Babylonian exile. The Hebrew, or Jewish people, had been conquered and enslaved by the Babylonian Empire. And Daniel was living in Babylon. And this was a challenging time for the Hebrew people. They thought they were God's chosen people, and yet God allowed them to be conquered and defeated and taken away into slavery. They thought they had been given the promised land, Palestine, and yet they lost the land, and now they were enslaved in a foreign land. And it's during this time that God spoke to Daniel and revealed his plans to him. And through these plans, God was making promises to his people and giving them hope. So that's the story. That's where we are in the book of Daniel. So now, in the words of David Platt, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, turn, swipe, scroll, whatever it is you do to Daniel chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, the text will be up here, and you can follow along as I read it out loud. So here is Daniel 9, verses 1 through 23. In the first year of Darius, the son of Hasuerus, a Mede by birth, who was made king over the Chaldean kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books, according to the word of the Lord, to the prophet Jeremiah, that the number of years for the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70. So I turned my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and petitions with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Ah, Lord, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keeps his commands. We have sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, and turned away from your commands and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, leaders, ancestors, and all the people of the land. Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but this day public shame belongs to us. The men of Judah, the residents of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are near and those who are far, and all the countries where you have banished them because of the disloyalty they have shown toward you. Lord, public, sh public shame belongs to us our kings, our leaders, and our ancestors, because we have sinned against you. Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God, though we have rebelled against him, and have not obeyed the Lord our God by following his instructions that he set before us through his servants the prophets. All Israel has broken your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. The promised curse written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. He has carried out his words that he spoke against us and against our rulers by bringing on us a disaster that is so great that nothing like what has been done to Jerusalem has ever been done under all of heaven. Just as is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us 
Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquities and paying attention to your truth. So the Lord kept the disaster in mind and brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all he has done, but we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a strong hand and made your name renowned as it is to this day, we have sinned, we have acted wickedly. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, may your anger and wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of, your, because of our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors, Jerusalem and your people have become an object of ridicule to all those around us. Therefore, our God, hear the prayer and the petitions of your servant. Make your face shine on your desolate sanctuary for the Lord's sake. Listen closely, my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that bears your name. For we are not presenting our petitions before you based on our righteous acts, but based on your abundant compassion. Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act. My God, for your own sake, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. While I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my petition before the Lord my God concerning the holy mountain of my God. While I was praying, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the first vision, reached me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me this explanation. Daniel, I have come now to give you understanding. At the beginning of your petitions, an answer went out, and I have come to give it, for you are treasured by God. So consider the message and understand the vision. Now, you might have noticed, I stopped this passage right before Gabriel gives his message. Gabriel is an angel. We've seen him before in chapter 8 and other parts of the Bible. This angel comes to give him a message, but I've stopped the passage there. Next time, we look at Daniel in a couple of weeks. We'll continue on and we'll see what Daniel, uh, Gabriel has to say. But for now, I'm stopping here. And we're going to look at just this first part of this chapter. And to explain why, let's look at what happened in verses 20 through 23. <clears throat> verses 20 and 21 say that while Daniel was praying, Gabriel, the angel who had spoken to him before in chapter 8, came to him again. And then verse 22 tells us that Gabriel came to give Daniel a new vision and explain what is going to happen. So here's the question I want us to consider first of all. Why are verses 1 through 19 included at all. If you think about it, verses 1 through 3 tell us the date and that Daniel started praying. And then verses 21 and, uh, 20 and 21 tell us that Daniel was praying. So there's some redundancy there already. And why do we need verses 4 through 19, which is the actual prayer, at all? <clears throat> why didn't Daniel just tell us that one day he was praying and the angel Gabriel came to give him a prophecy? Or why even tell us that he was praying at all? Why not just say, the angel Gabriel came and gave me a message? What is the purpose of all this extra information? Well, there is a reason. Everything in a good story serves the purpose of the story. And same thing in biblical literature. There's a reason it's there. Those of you who have been here a, a long time might remember that in the past I've talked about the genealogies in Genesis. If you've read through Genesis, you know there are a lot of genealogies. Last week, John read us one. So there are these genealogies, and they seem to go on. You're just the son of, 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 the son of. And you just, you're going, what is happening here? There's 42, 48 of them. Yeah, I keep going. And that's just one section of the genealogies. There's a bunch of them. And you're like, what is going on here? But these genealogies actually serve a purpose. The genealogies in Genesis actually trace the storyline of how God has worked to fulfill his promises through the family of Adam and Eve and Abraham. These genealogies show us that God has kept his promise that one of the sons of Eve would defeat Satan, and that a son of Abraham would become a blessing to the whole world, and that a son of Judah and a son of David would become king forever. These genealogies 
makes sense when we keep this whole story in mind. They're showing God's faithfulness and trustworthiness through history. And somehow, then, this introduction, this prayer, must also serve this purpose of showing us something about the message. They're here for a reason. And ultimately, the reason they're here in Daniel supports the whole message of the Bible. And what is that message? What is the message of the Bible? Well, it's the message of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. God created a good and perfect world, but we sinned. We brought sin and brokenness into the world, but God didn't leave us there. He had a plan for redemption, our rescue. And that rescue will ultimately lead to a complete restoration of everything that was lost in the fall. We'll be back in the garden, walking with God in a close and personal relationship with him. And sin will be defeated. Sin will be no more. Brokenness will be no more. All the suffering of the world will cease. It will be gone. But how do we know any of this is true? How do we know this message is true? How do we know we can trust God? That's a fundamental question that every one of us asks. Every time you're tempted to sin, you're asking yourself, can I trust God? Are his promises true? Are his warnings true? Are his rules good? That's what Eve wondered in the garden when she was tempted and what we wonder every single day. If God's big story, the story of creation, fall, redemption, restoration, are true, they're going to impact our lives today. And we need to believe these promises. And that's the first thing we see demonstrated here in this passage. So if we look back at verses 1 through 3, this is what we read. In the first year of Darius, the son of Asuras, a Mede by birth, who was made king over the Chaldean kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books, according to the word of the Lord, to the prophet Jeremiah, that the number of years for the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70. So I turned my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and petitions, with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, notice that what he says as he's reading is the word of the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah. Highlighted, underline that for you. Uh, what this tells us is that Daniel trusts the word of God. And he considered the book of Jeremiah to be the word of God. Part of the Bible today. It's God's word. And so he's reading through Jeremiah. And one day he comes across a promise from God. Uh, the promise is actually found in two places in Jeremiah, chapters 25 and chapters 29. And here's what it says. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, it says, This whole land will become a desolate ruin, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. And then later in Jeremiah 29, it says, For this is what the Lord says, When 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and I will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. So both of these promises tell the Hebrew people that they're going to be enslaved in Babylon for 70 years. And so Daniel's reading this book, and he comes to this promise, and he believed it. Daniel believed the book of Jeremiah. He believed it was the word of God, and that God's promises in this book were true and reliable. Now Daniel knew he had been in Babylon for 67 years. Now verse 1 tells us the year that this event happened. One of those things that seems like, why are you telling me what year this happened in? But because based on that, we know this was the 67th year of the exile. So Daniel believes this time, this 70 years, is coming to an end. It's not far off. God had warned the people that they'd be in Babylon for 70 years, and now it's been 67. And that leads Daniel to prayer. Verse 3 says, So I turned my attention to the Lord, God, to seek him by prayer and petitions with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So Daniel turned to prayer, but he also fasted, and he put on sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth and ashes were just cultural ways back then that they would show they were grieving. Okay, You know, um, 70, 80 years ago in America, 
uh, men after a funeral would wear a black armband. You know? In the Victorian ages, women would wear black dresses for a period of time after you know, a husband or a parent died. So different cultural ways of showing grief. In their culture, they put on sackcloth and ashes. <clears throat> Fasting, he also mentions here. Fasting was done for lots of reasons back then. In this case, it was probably a combination of grieving and hopefulness. Grief for the sins of the people and hope in the promise of God. So now as a side note, fasting is an important concept in the Bible. If you've read the Bible much, you've probably come across references like this to fasting. Jesus said Christians would fast. The problem is that while references to fasting are pretty common in the Bible, fasting is never really the main point of any passage. So there's not anywhere in the Bible where you can get a really exhaustive description of fasting. Okay? So to understand fasting, you can't just find one passage in the Bible. You have to take all the things the Bible says about fasting and put it together in a systematic way. And we're not going to do that right now. <laughs> that's not the point. We're focusing on the point of this passage, and that's not the point of the passage. But I am going to put on Facebook, on our Facebook page later today, a link to a scanned chapter or a PDF chapter of a book called Habits of Grace. And this chapter is all about fasting. And I strongly encourage you to go on there later and read it. Um, if you're not active on Facebook, you don't actually have to be a Facebook uh, member or anything. It's just facebook.com slash UC Lakeland. And on the public page, uh, you can find this uh, chapter. And maybe we can even put it on Discord. Okay. Also, just as a side note, this book, Habits of Grace, happens to be one of the 50 plus books or so in our discipleship book list. If you don't know about the discipleship book list, it is a list of books that anyone can ask for at any time. You just tell me, I want this book because I want to read it, and I'll go on Amazon and order it from, for you from our ministry budget, and we'll get it. They're all great books, books that I high, highly encourage people to read. And by the way, you can find this discipleship book list on our resources we page. Resource. We have a resources <laughs> We have a resources page. It's our website, uclakeland.org slash resources. So just a little side note there, a little plug for a resources page, because some people don't know we have one. Uh, but if you go there, you can find that discipleship book list. But anyway, uh, we see in these first few verses of Daniel that Daniel believed God. He believed what he read from Jeremiah. And that led him to prayer. So then what did Daniel pray? So if we look back at verses 4 through 6, it says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Ah, Lord, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. We have sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, and turned away from your commands and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, leaders, ancestors, and all the people of the land. So Daniel begins by praising God for his greatness, his love, and his faithfulness. And then he confessed to the people's unworthiness of this. That's why Daniel had on sackcloth and ash. Daniel knew that the 70 years in Babylon were God's judgment for the people's sin. So how does this all fit into the purpose of the Bible, the big picture? This is telling us that everything that has happened with the Hebrew people has all been part of God's plan. It's part of the big story of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. God is an awe-inspiring God of power and of justice, and he does not ignore sin. But he's also a God of love and compassion and faithfulness. Back in Deuteronomy, which is referenced here a couple times uh, in his prayer, he mentions the law of Moses. That's the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So in one of those books, in the law of Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, which is written several hundred years before Daniel, God promised his people that if they disobeyed him and started following false gods, he would let them be conquered and taken off as prisoners into a foreign land. But he also promised that none of his other promises would fail. And that includes his promise to Abraham, 
that one of his descendants would bless the whole world. So let's look back at Deuteronomy chapter 30. It says, When all these things happen to you, the blessings and curses I have set before you, so this is being taken off into a foreign land, and you come to your senses while you are in the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and all your soul by doing everything I am commanding you today, then he will restore your fortunes, have compassion on you, and gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. Even if your exiles are the far, at the farthest horizon, he will gather you and bring you back from there. The Lord your God will bring you into the land your ancestors possessed, possessed and you will take possession of it. He will cause you to prosper and multiply you more than he did your ancestors. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants, and you will love him with all your heart and all your soul, so that you will live. So now Daniel knows these words. He references them a couple times in his prayer. He knows what God has promised, that God promised judgment for sin, but he also promised that he would be faithful to his promises. He promised that during the exile, when the people came to their senses and confessed their sin, God would forgive their sins and bring them back to the promised land that he had promised Abraham his descendants would possess. And that's why Daniel now, knowing this time is near, the 70 years, goes into prayer confessing the sinfulness of the people. He confesses that they deserved this exile. He confesses that they were unfaithful to God. But God is always faithful to them, he says. Again, Daniel trusts the word of God. He trusts that the Bible accurately and faithfully gives us the word of God. And he trusts that God will be faithful to his word, to his promises. And secondly, we see here that Daniel understands the exile as part of God's plan for his people. The Babylonian exile did not catch God off guard. He was in control the entire time. In the Babylonian exile, even though the people were defeated and taken off into slavery, did not mean that God had abandoned his people. God will never abandon his people. And this is massively important for us to understand. There will be times in our lives when things don't go well. Some of you have probably experienced that at some point. Things didn't go how you wanted them to go. But God does not abandon his people. In fact, the book of Romans makes it clear. It says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son so that they would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So think about that. Everything that happens is for our good. Even the hard things, even the suffering, they're all tools that God uses for our good. If you were at State Collegiate Conference a week ago, Cam Triggs mentioned a verse a few verses before this, uh, Romans 8, 18. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed in us. Suffering is a momentary problem that results in our ultimate good. Again, everything works for our good, even suffering. Yes, suffering is a bad thing. It's a product of the fall. God created a good and perfect world where there was no suffering. But suffering came into the world because of sin. But God is redeeming us out of that. And he will restore us back to that perfection where there is no suffering. And it will make the suffering look like nothing in comparison. Nobody in heaven is going to be complaining about their momentary suffering back on earth. Back in this life. And we will even see this suffering as something that worked for our good because it made us more like Jesus. It conformed us into the image of his son, Paul said in Romans. Daniel believes this exile is momentary and that God still cares about his people. Daniel believes that the people have been sinful and they deserved his judgment. But Daniel also believes that God is good to his people and he will never abandon his people. So how can that be true, though, if they've been sold into slavery, if they've been defeated. Well, because this is all part of God's plan of redemption. 
God has made promises, and he's keeping all of them. He kept his promise to exile the people if they sinned and follow other gods. And he will keep his promise to bring them back into the promised land. So if we look more at the prayer, he says, Lord, public shame belongs to us because we have sinned against you. Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God, though we have rebelled against him. All Israel has broken your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. The promised curse written in the law of Moses, back in Deuteronomy, the servant of God has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. Daniel explicitly says that the exile was the promised result of Israel's sin. He explicitly says that they deserved it. He says that shame belongs to the people. But he also says that compassion and forgiveness belong to God. The whole prayer is a comparison between the sinfulness of the people and the goodness of God. The whole prayer is pointing backwards to the deserved judgment, but also forward to the promised hope. Let's look at verses 16 and 18. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, may your anger and wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. Listen closely, my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation in the city that bears your name. For we are not presenting our petitions before you based on our righteous acts, but based on your abundant compassion. Notice there that Daniel is contrasting the righteousness of God and the unrighteousness of the people. His claim to God, the claim he has to call on God and restore the people, is not based on anything good in the people. They're sinners. They deserve the exile. Instead, his claim is based on the goodness of God. God made promises to his people, and Daniel call, calls on God to fulfill those promises. Again, Daniel sees this all in light of the grand narrative of the Bible. God has promised his people, the Hebrew people, that they would be in the promised land and that they would be a blessing to the whole world. These are promises that God will keep, and Daniel believes that. And so Daniel prays in confident hopefulness. He confesses sin and he grieves for that sin, but he also has confidence in God. So that's the next thing. Daniel has confidence that God will fulfill all his promises to his people. Now, what is all this confidence and hope ultimately based on? What is the ultimate path of redemption? Are we just doomed to this cycle of judgment and compassion? And then we fall into sin again and we're judged and we're calling out for compassion again, just a cycle. Um, if you look at the history of Israel, you'll see that. If you look at the book of Judges especially, you will see this ongoing cycle, and that does not seem very hopeful. But ultimately, the hope that this is pointing to is leading to Jesus. The book of Hebrews tells us that the purpose of the law was actually not to stop us from sinning, because we couldn't, but to show us that we couldn't stop sinning. God knew we couldn't be made perfect through the law. So why did he give us the law? Because we didn't know that we couldn't be perfect through the law. We tried. It never worked. Even today, many religions ultimately are based on this idea. You have to earn your way into heaven. That's the message of Islam. Stop sinning and be better. Just do what is right. Do what God tells you to do. That's ultimately what Buddhism says, although it's more philosophical. But just do the right thing. But the message of Christianity is that you're not going to be good enough. You need a redeemer. You need to be redeemed. Remember, this whole exile was promised in Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 6 that we read earlier. But let's look back at verses 5 and 6. The Lord your God will bring you into the promised land, the land your ancestors possessed, possessed, and you will take possession of it. He will cause you to prosper and multiply you more than he did your ancestors. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the hearts of your descendants, and you will love him with all your heart and all your soul, so that you will live. Now look closely at what God is saying there. Way back in Deuteronomy, more than a thousand years before Jesus, he says, after they're exiled for their disobedience, God would bring them back to the promised land. He would bless them. But more than that, he would change their hearts. He would change their hearts so that they would love him. God had already told his people to love him, but they're not going to. Not for long, at least. They will continue to sin. 
But God also tells them that one day he will change their hearts so that they will love him. That's a promise of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. If we look back at Romans 8 again, it says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purposes. So there, command, got to love God. But it goes on, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Why does everything, even the bad things and the suffering, work out for the good of those who love God? Because God is making those things happen. He predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. As I mentioned earlier, suffering helps us be more like Jesus. It helps us to be compassionate toward other people. It helps us, help, or ho helps us hope in the eternity. It helps us learn the evilness of sin. It helps us demonstrate faith to others. And all of this ultimately works because of the work of God in our lives. As Deuteronomy said, it's God who changes our hearts. And as Romans said, it's God who planned and executed this from the beginning of time. This plan is still in progress. If you're a Christian, you have been predestined by God to be conformed to the image of Jesus. It's happening and it will be completed. He called you, he justified you, or took away your sins through Jesus. He glorified you by making you a child of God, by promising you eternity and glory. He made you a co-heir with Jesus. All of creation will one day be under our rule with Jesus. This is all guaranteed, and this is all in the plan that we see in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel doesn't know the whole plan. He's living centuries before Jesus, but he knows that God has made promises to his people, and he believes those promises are true, and will be fulfilled, every single one of them. So what's the point of this section of Daniel? How does it fit into the message of the whole Bible? Why didn't Daniel just skip the whole prayer part and just tell us an angel came and gave him the message? Well, this section is showing us that Daniel understands the exile as part of God's plan. It's showing us that Daniel understands the exile's fulfillment of a promise from Deuteronomy, that God would judge sin. But this section is also showing us that Daniel trusts that God will likewise fulfill his promises in Jeremiah to end the exile after 70 years and to bring the people back to the promised land. This section tells us that when Daniel calls on God to restore the people, he's not claiming that the people deserve it. In fact, he says the people did deserve it, they deserve the judgment, not deserving redemption. But Daniel's calling on God to be who God is, to be faithful to his own promises. This passage fits in the grand narrative because right here we see the fall and the redemption. We see human sinfulness and God's goodness. We see God working out his plan and fulfilling all his promises. We see the answer to why there's suffering in the world because of human sin. And we see the solution to that suffering, God's plan of redemption and restoration. At the time, Daniel was looking for the restoration to the promised land. That was promised in Deuteronomy and in Jeremiah. But that didn't solve sin. And that's why in Deuteronomy, God promised that after the redemption to the promised land, he would change their hearts so that they wouldn't be left in that cycle of sin and judgment and calling out for forgiveness and being restored and then falling back into sin and judgment. The true redemption we needed was for God to change our hearts. And that comes through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin so that God's judgment was satisfied. Sin was not ignored. And Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to change our hearts, to give us faith. So it's not up to us to remain faithful anymore. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in us. He keeps us faithful. The cycle is broken because if your heart is changed by God, you will never abandon him to follow other gods. Not that you're instantly perfect or you're never gonna sin again, after all, you're still being conformed to the image of Jesus. You aren't there yet, but the end result is guaranteed, not by you, but by the Holy Spirit in you. Philippians says, I am sure of this, 
that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Jennifer mentioned that verse in her prayer today. And that was not planned. But it's a, a massively important verse, if we remember that. He who began the work will carry it on to completion. It's not up to you. It's the work of God in your life. Now, as Christians, we look at this passage, and there are some things that we can learn and apply from Daniel. First, when we pray, we should pray based on the word of God. Know the promises of God in the Bible. Believe them and pray based on them. Daniel prayed based on the promises in Deuteronomy and Jeremiah. He prayed in faith that God keeps his promises to his people. But you need to know what the Bible's promises are. So read the Bible and pray from it. Uh, there's a good video on our resources page called Praying the Bible. Uh, most of you have already watched it because uh, I ask people to watch it before they lead a prayer on Sunday morning. But in that, Donald Whitney uh, teaches how to pray through the Psalms. But it's a method that you can use for any part of the Bible. Praying based on God's Word. So read the Bible and pray based on the Bible. You need to know what those promises are. Uh, you're not promised health and wealth. So don't believe the televangelists teaching that garbage. But you are promised that everything that happens is for your good in the end. You aren't promised that you will never be tempted by sin. But you are promised that God will provide a way out. So when you face temptation, pray for the Spirit to guide you out. You aren't promised that if you mail in a check for $1,000 to some ministry, that you're going to get a new job and a shiny new car. But you are promised that anything you invest, whether it's money or time or any other resource, for the kingdom of God will be rewarded infinitely more in heaven. You aren't promised that if you pray for something, you will get exactly what you prayed for. But you are promised that your Father in heaven hears your prayers and will answer your prayers, although not always how you want it. And you are promised his answers will be better than what you wanted because he knows what you truly need to accomplish his will for your life and to be conformed to the likeness of his son. And that ties into the second thing we can learn from this passage. Pray believing that God hears and answers your prayers. One interesting aspect of this passage is that Daniel tells us in verses 20 and 21 something important. He says, while I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my petition before the Lord my God concerning the holy mountain of my God, while I was praying, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the first vision, reached me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. Now, you've probably heard me say a few times, if something in the Bible is repeated, it's probably important. You've heard that before, it's worth repeating now. If something's repeated, it's probably important. When you're in classes, if your professor says something over and over, it's probably important. Same thing in the Bible. And what's repeated here is the phrase, while I was praying. Daniel wants to emphasize that it was while he was praying these things that God sent an angel to him. In other words, the angel didn't just show up at some random time. Daniel's telling us that the angel came in response to his prayers. God was answering his prayers. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that Gabriel has never showed up while you guys were praying. Okay? That's okay. This is not a normal thing. Not even for Daniel. This is not normally what happened when Daniel prayed. Events like this are very rare in the Bible, so we shouldn't expect them to be normal in our lives. But what this does demonstrate is that God hears our prayers immediately, and he answers our prayers. In fact, in verse 23... Gabriel said to Daniel, at the beginning of your petitions, an answer went out. God knows our hearts and knows what we're going to ask even before we ask it. But Daniel, or God, sorry, God did wait until Daniel began praying. But he sent Gabriel out at the beginning of the prayer. God wasn't waiting to see. I wonder what Daniel's going to ask for. Let me see if it's something I'm going to answer. God already knew all that. But he waited for Daniel to begin praying and then sent the answer. Prayer is an odd thing. If you've been a Christian for a little while, you've probably thought about this. If you're not a Christian, you've probably heard about Christians praying and thought that's an odd thing. Prayer is an odd thing. If we're praying for things that God has promised, as I said we should do, 
and God always fulfills his promises, then why do we need to pray for them? If God promised the exile would end after 70 years, why did Daniel pray for the end of the exile? Wasn't it already guaranteed? Well, yes, it was. But we're still commanded to pray for a few reasons. First, it glorifies God because it demonstrates our faith in him. Daniel was demonstrating faith here. He believed the promises of God and he believed those promises and that's what led him to prayer. Second, it glorifies God by demonstrating our reliance on him. We know we can't accomplish these things on our own and we know that God is in control. So Daniel began praying by acknowledging God as the awe-inspiring power of the universe. He mentioned that God had brought the people out of slavery in Egypt with a strong hand. But now he had brought them into slavery in Babylon. Daniel knows that God is in control and only God can rescue them. He knows that they'll escape slavery, but he knows that it's God who will do it. The people are totally reliant on God. When we pray, we're also acknowledging that God is ultimately in control of our own lives. We act and we do things, but God decides the outcomes. If you're familiar with the book of Nehemiah, that's a great illustration of how the people acted in rational and wise ways to reestablish the nation after the exile. But ultimately, it was God who was in control of the entire process. Third, prayer helps conform us to the image of Jesus. Because when we're praying based on God's word, we're internalizing his word. We're internalizing his desires, his will, his commands, his promises. We are, in a manner, preaching to ourselves when we pray based on the Bible. We're teaching ourselves and reminding ourselves who God is and what his will is for our lives. And fourth, God has simply ordained that he will work through our prayers. In Acts chapter 4, the Christian church was facing persecution, and so they prayed for courage. And the writer tells us, at that moment, God, through the Holy Spirit, gave them courage. Now, those of you who remember Luke Aiello from a few years back, uh, Luke once commented that he noticed when he prayed for chances to share the good news of Jesus, he found more chances to share the good news of Jesus. God has simply ordained that sometimes he works through our prayers. God is pleased to work through our prayers. And so we pray. And we see prayer modeled in this passage from Daniel. But more than that, we see God in this passage. We see God as the Elohim, which you might remember, is just the Hebrew title for God as the creator king. He is in absolute control. And Isaiah declared that God declares the beginning from the end. Everything that happens is because of God. He makes promises and he fulfills them because he is sovereign. As Job said, no plan of God's can be thwarted. But we also see God here presented as Yahweh or Jehovah, which, as you might remember as well, is just that covenantal name of God, the personal name of God that God gave his people when he formed a covenant with them. We see God here as not just the one who's faithful to his promises, but he's faithful to the promises he made to his people because he is good to his people. We see God here as the one who listens to our prayers and answers them. We see God here presented as he's presented throughout the Bible, literally from the beginning to the end. He is both the Elohim and the Yahweh. He's the creator who created a good and perfect world, but also as the covenant-making God who created people for a relationship with them. He's the God who is not surprised by the fall of man. He wasn't caught off guard by our sin. We know this because Paul wrote in 1 Timothy that God had salvation planned before time began. Before he created anything, he knew what was going to happen. And so here we see God who redeems us. He's the God who made a plan of redemption to Eve in Genesis. Made promises to Eve. He made promises to Abraham. He made promises to Jacob and to Moses and to David, to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, so many more. All these plans and promises for redemption. It's a plan we see throughout the Bible. God making promises 
that all point to the one real promise, that Jesus would come and redeem us, both because he's our Savior and he's our King. And he became our Savior and our King for us. And this promise was a promise not just to restore us, but to restore the entire world. When God promised Eve that one of her descendants would defeat Satan, that was not just a promise to forgive our sins. It was a promise to defeat sin, to destroy sin. It was a promise to restore us to eternal life, into peace with God. And that all is encapsulated here in this passage. This passage isn't an unnecessary description of prayer. It's an illustration of the glory of God and his love for his people. If you're here today and you don't know God, if you can't imagine a God who cares about you this deeply, or a God who knows all your faults, even every bad thought you've ever had in your lives, and yet loves you and has offered a relationship with you, if that's you, if you don't know God like this, then today is a chance to get to know him. Today is a chance to hear his word in the Bible and respond to him, to put your trust in him, to confess your sins as Daniel did, but to also call upon God's goodness and compassion. If you want to know more about God like that, then talk to one of us during lunch. We would love to have that conversation. Uh, but right now, let's close in prayer. Lord, you are truly great and awe-inspiring. You are the creator king who made everything from nothing. You're the one who made mankind in your image and blessed us with a relationship with you. But we've sinned, we've done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, and turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your word that you spoke to people and gave us in the Bible. We've not even listened to our own consciences that you gave to every person. We know, even apart from your word, that we are guilty. We all have things hidden in our lives that we hope no one ever knows about us. We have evil thoughts, anger, jealousy, lust. And so our natural state is to stand before you guilty. Our natural state is to stand in shame. But you are righteous and perfect and good. You cannot tolerate evil. You cannot overlook evil. You cannot let the brokenness of your creation go without response. And so you promised judgment of sin. You promised that every act of evil will be held accountable. But you also promised forgiveness and redemption. You promised restoration. You promised that both your justice and your love would be equally displayed and completely fulfilled. And you accomplished this through your son Jesus who being fully God and fully man, he lived the perfect sinless life on our behalf. And he died in our place as the perfect sacrifice for us. Your justice was done and the cost of every sin was paid. And your love was shown as your people were completely forgiven and justified before you. And so now we can stand in your presence without shame and without guilt. We stand in your presence as your children adopted into your family. We stand in your presence forgiven we stand in your presence as people whose hearts have been changed by you. If there's anyone here who doesn't know you that way, we pray that you change their hearts, reveal yourself to them, and bring them into a relationship with you. And help us to tell others about you and to proclaim your good news. Give us opportunities and boldness to tell people about Jesus and what he has done. Let us see your work in our lives as you continue to conform us into the image of your son, as you continue to make all things work for our good, as you continue to carry out the good work that you began in us. Let us praise your name as we see you working in our lives. Let us live our lives in faith of what you have done and are doing and will do. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.